Stick with trigger and you'll make it. Hey guys, this is Jarbo Gaming, and let me start off by saying I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. Let's hope it doesn't disappoint. Yet what is a nation? Can we actually see the physical lines that divide one from another? Oh yeah, I'm liking where this guy's going with this. Somehow, I managed to make it all the way to 2024 without ever touching Ace Combat 7 Skies Unknown. But now, after recently playing through the majority of the main entries in the series, it's finally time to see what the latest has to offer. Will it improve upon the action-packed gameplay that I've come to love and expect? Will the story be an improvement over Sixes? Please God, don't let it be worse. And most of all, how will it stack up against the PS2's Holy Trinity? Will it in any way compete? It's time to find out. The game released almost exactly five years ago, in early 2019, for the Xbox One and PS4, and oh my god, it also released on PC shortly after. As someone who is primarily a PC gamer, this is a huge plus, and let me tell you, going from playing Nace Combat 6 at 30 FPS to 7, with maxed out settings and a constant 120 FPS, it was like the gates of heaven had opened and invited me in. Glorious. And while I didn't personally play on console, I'm happy to report that it runs, for the most part, at a smooth 60 FPS there as well. So overall, a nice return to form for the series from a technical standpoint. Visually, the game is stunning. It looks exactly how I would expect the modern Ace Combat to look. Plane models, explosions, volumetric clouds, weather effects, cockpits, vapor trails, everything is just eye candy. While there's an occasional blurry texture or building that pops in due to draw distance here or there, you'll most likely never notice it unless you're really looking for it, especially while in the middle of the action. Sound design's also on point. From the roar of your engines, to missiles whizzing by, laser weapons and more, the audio really does a great job of pulling you into the action, perhaps better than ever before. And while we're on the topic of audio, it goes without saying that at this point, I've come to expect Ace Combat games to deliver some powerful, emotional soundtracks. Yep, they nailed it. There are some absolute bangers in here, with some of my favorites being Battle for Farbanti, Dual Wielder, and Alicorn. The visual and audio design really complement one another in a way that helps to contribute to the game's immersion factor while you're screeching across the skies of Strange Reel. Which I must say, the gameplay offered here is absolutely top notch and dare I say, the best of the franchise. Engaging in air-to-air -air or air-to-ground combat has never felt better. Shooting enemies down is satisfying, regardless of if you're using missiles or guns. Which, I was slightly sad to see the guns nerfed compared to their performance in Fires of Liberation, but that may have been necessary. They were definitely a little OP before. Enemies are more deadly than ever, whether in the sky, on the ground, or in the sea. Particularly the latter. Man oh man, taking on ships in this one actually proved challenging at times, thanks in part to them having the ability to defend themselves against incoming missile attacks with sea whiz systems. Engaging them effectively requires the player to make a low approach, preferably with anti-ship missiles to avoid their anti-missile defense systems. And over land, it's not just SAMs that are a threat anymore. AA guns that could be all but ignored in previous titles will now light your ass up, particularly if you slow down while attacking nearby targets, turning them into a real nuisance. Of course, enemy aircraft are a bigger threat than ever with seemingly improved AI, especially in higher difficulties. Drones in particular can be a real nuisance with their exceptional speed and agility. Which, yeah, drones are a pretty large chunk of the story and gameplay of Ace Combat 7 and were without a doubt my least favorite targets to fight against. I just prefer dogfighting real flesh and blood pilots, but with the way the story is structured and the way the world of Strange Reel is progressing into the future, having drones as enemies does make sense, even if I'm not a huge fan of facing off against them. We'll touch more on the story and how they fit in in a bit. The game sees the return of the ability to perform high G maneuvers by holding down both bumpers and pulling back on the stick, allowing you to make some pretty crazy sharp turns at the expense of speed. But there's also another new feature that I didn't discover until I was roughly halfway through my first playthrough. Post stall maneuvers. You know how ace combat antagonists always seem to be able to perform turns that defy the laws of physics while dogfighting? 
doing things such as making immediate about faces or performing cobras that the game's flight engine just doesn't seem to let you do? Yep, you can do that now. As long as your aircraft is capable of PSM, which not all seem to be, if your speed is below 500 km an hour, you can hold both bumpers and pull back on the stick to initiate a maneuver, allowing you to do some literally gravity-defying stunts. I thought this was a really cool addition to the game, and while I really haven't been able to use this to its full effectiveness in dogfights yet, I have a feeling it's something that I'll eventually master the more and more I use it. The main campaign features a good variety of mission types that offer quite a bit more, as far as gameplay is concerned, than your typical kill a certain amount of points worth of targets before time runs out missions. Not to say that these types of missions are bad, I actually quite enjoy them myself, but you wouldn't want every single mission to be that. You of course have your standard shoot defenseless bombers mission to open up the campaign, there's navigating radar detection zones, another classic that everyone loves, finding enemy targets in a sandstorm that pop on and off of radar, popping out of cloud cover to strike at targets to avoid a missile defense system, an escort mission, getting to defend a classic ace combat 4 location, laser designating for bombers, facing off against enemy aces, a stealthy nighttime trench run, shooting down big bad super weapons, and of course flying inside some internal structures to conclude the campaign. There was really only one gameplay mechanic that I didn't enjoy, and it was present for a couple of missions in the latter half of the game. It requires the player to get in close to enemies to ID them as friend or foe before firing. I get why this was in the game, as far as story is concerned, but I just didn't feel like it was a good gameplay mechanic personally. Maybe I'm alone on this, definitely let me know your thoughts down below. Perhaps the biggest change that can be felt during gameplay is the introduction of the weather system, which can have quite a profound impact during missions. In addition to the pretty particle effects that can be seen, such as rain droplets accumulating on your screen while flying through a cloud, clouds and storms can greatly impact your ability to lock or see targets, the tracking of your missiles, and your maneuverability if you're caught in an updraft. Flying into cloud cover at the right time while being pursued by enemies or while you have a missile alert is a strategy that can be used to great effectiveness if you decide to do so. And rain and wind isn't the only thing that will impact you either. Lightning can strike your craft, shorting out your HUD, forcing you to fly blind with controls that seem to fight against you. Your aircraft can also ice up if you stray for too long inside a cloud bank, reducing your maneuverability, although it's worth noting that there's a de-icing upgrade that can be equipped to help reduce the impacts of this. That upgrade is just one of many offered that can be used to improve the effectiveness of your craft in a number of ways. These upgrades are accessed within a new feature of the game, the aircraft tree. Gone are the days of planes becoming available for purchase and just being able to save up money for the ones you really want. In Ace Combat 7, there's a branching tree of upgrades and aircraft to progress through by spending credits you earn after completing each mission. The tree looks a little intimidating at first, but it's really not that bad. You do need to, however, plan ahead and choose what aircraft you want to ultimately go for further down the tree. Eventually, if you play enough, you'll be able to unlock everything, but for your first playthrough at least, you should make the decision of going for either eastern or western aircraft and see which way through the tree you need to progress. For example, if you want to get into the cockpit of an SU-57, you really should focus on progressing through the more bottom section of the tree. Now certain upgrades that you want may be tied up in another section of the tree altogether, so eventually you'll probably want to progress towards some of those, even if the aircraft you're unlocking along the way aren't necessarily ones you want to fly. Ultimately, the choice is yours in how you want to progress, I would just suggest to do a little planning ahead for your own sake. The aircraft tree is also where special weapons are purchased for aircraft. All aircraft have three different selections available, with choices ranging from more standard ones like anti-ship missiles or four-target air-to-air missiles, to more exotic choices such as lasers or railguns. Multiplayer is also available in the game, and it was my first exposure to ever playing Ace Combat with other live humans. There really aren't that many people playing on PC, but regardless, I was still able to find some matches. The mode features two game types. Battle Royale and Team Deathmatch, so it's strictly PvP. It's a damn shame there isn't any sort of co-op offered, as I feel like there'd be some real potential for a lot of fun with friends in a PvE mode of some kind. Maybe this is something we'll get with Ace Combat 8, fingers crossed. And yeah, I'm pretty dog shit at PvP in this game, but to be fair, I haven't unlocked any of the multiplayer exclusive parts in the aircraft tree yet, which do offer some pretty great bonuses. I'm sure I'll get better over time, maybe. So this next part is where I was a little nervous coming into this one, story. Ace Combat 6's story is fresh in my mind after just completing a playthrough of it, and I would consider its story just average at best. It was certainly a step down from the stories offered in the PS2's Holy Trinity. So would Skies Unknown correct the biggest misstep of its predecessor? To put it shortly, yes, I think it did. The story is split up into two different narratives. 
There's a narrative that's told in pre-rendered cutscenes that are shown prior to some of the campaign missions, and then the narrative that's told by playing through the campaign itself via mission briefing and in-game dialogue. The story that's experienced through missions and gameplay puts the player in the shoes of an OCM pilot, call sign Trigger, in the year 2019, 15 years after the events of Ace Combat 4, during a conflict that would go on to be known as the Lighthouse War. Much like the Continental War featured in Ace Combat 4, this conflict features a clash between the two powers of Eurusia and Osea. Following the events of both the Ulysses Impact event and the Continental War, the continent of Usia is devastated. In an effort to help the shattered region, in the early 2010s, President Harling helps push efforts to construct an enormous space elevator, with hopes of supplying energy and aid to the impacted countries. The purpose behind the construction of the massive structure is misconstrued by many, and over time, anti-Ocean sentiment begins to grow amongst the Erusians. Some begin to believe that the actual purpose of the space elevator was not to provide aid, but instead to exert Ocean control over the Ocean continent. This all comes to a climax when Eurusia suddenly declares war, using ship and container launched MQ-99 drones to perform simultaneous strikes against multiple Ocean targets. The strikes are so precise that not a single civilian casualty is inflicted. The Eurusians are able to seize control of the space elevator, which was, at the time, being visited by ex-president Harling. Playing as Trigger, you work to push back against the Eurusian assault before a tragedy occurs during a rescue attempt. Shortly after, we learn that we're convicted of supposedly committing a heinous crime and assigned a spare squadron, a penal military unit composed of Ocean personnel that is considered highly expendable. Over the course of several missions and after countless threats of being thrown into solitary, the legitimacy of spare squadron is solidified after Operation Flush and all of its members are pardoned. We then go on the transfer to and become flight lead for Strider Squadron, which is where Trigger would remain for the rest of the conflict, gaining notoriety for helping in the defense of Stonehenge, downing a massive arsenal bird, and more. The exploits of Strider Squadron, led by the player, ultimately are responsible for Osea coming out on top at the end of the conflict. The pre-rendered cutscenes are narrated from the perspective of several different characters, and although they're mostly separate from the game's primary story that you experience as the player, there is a bit of overlap that occurs at times. The character we're introduced to first is Avril Mead, a talented mechanic who fulfills her dream of restoring an old F-104, only to be shot down shortly after for violating wartime air laws just as the Lighthouse War was beginning. She survives her encounter with the Ocean Air Force, who was unable to identify her as friendly since she lacked an IFF or radio. Afterwards, she finds herself at the 444th Air Base, the same prison base that Trigger finds himself at after being convicted. Eventually, after working for some time restoring formerly mothballed aircraft at the base, she earns herself the nickname Scrap Queen. Avril continues to play a part in the story as it progresses, using her engineering skills to assist her allies whenever possible. The next character we're introduced to is Dr. Schroeder, a scientist employed by none other than Grunder Industries. This is the guy who's responsible for all those damn drones we're fighting throughout the game. He's also Belkin. Throughout his narration sequences, we learn that his goal is to further improve the capabilities of Eurusia's drones by uploading them with data obtained from the legendary ace Mihai Shalaj, otherwise known as Mr. X. We're first introduced to Mihai fairly early on in the story as he's returning from a flight in a signature Su-30. Honestly, this guy has all the makings of a badass ace combat antagonist. He's older, being a veteran of multiple past conflicts, yet despite his age and deteriorating body, is able to get the upper hand on essentially anyone in a dogfight, toying with most opponents like mere playthings. Mihai's kingdom is the sky. He doesn't really care about politics or war, as long as he gets to fly. That's all that matters. The man comes from an era before drones, when a dogfight was solely the will and skills of one pilot versus those of another. He ends up regretting working with Schroeder to give his data to be uploaded, and at one point even pleads with Trigger to put a stop to the drones. We see the love and affection that his granddaughter show for him over the course of the story, as well as learning of his origins, which helps to humanize the man, making him more than just another talented enemy ace to shoot down. Rosa Cassette, the Princess of Eurusia, is another character whose perspective we get to experience. Initially, she acts as a sort of figurehead for the Eurusian ideals that are shown during the country's initial offensive, having been convinced that the Ocean's motives for the space elevator were not in favor of her country. Events transpire during the war, however, that alter her perception of the conflict and lead to her second guessing if Eurusia was actually justified in their offensive. She finds herself called to action to help change the potential outcome of the conflict. 
I honestly felt the story of this one was pretty great. I wasn't the biggest fan of Avril's character and would have much rather spent more time focusing on Mihai, who I feel with just a little more focus could have been perhaps the most iconic ace combat antagonist ever. But regardless, the story still kept me engaged and on the edge of my seat as I played through it. There were some pretty big events that occurred, particularly in the latter half of the game, that I wasn't expecting, which was a pleasant surprise. Overall, it was a huge step up from Ace Combat 6, that's for sure. I really enjoyed the references to past games in the series as I played through too. There's definitely a ton of fan service here. The final one caught me completely off guard. I won't spoil who makes an appearance, but if you're a fan of Ace Combat 5, it'll certainly leave you with a smile on your face. Before we conclude, I'd like to also mention one other thing, DLC, particularly the three missions that are offered. These are 100% worth purchasing, especially if you can pick them up on sale. The missions essentially offer their own contained story that takes place during the Lighthouse War, during which a Eurasian officer named Matias Torres refuses orders to scuttle a massive craft known as the Alicorn. Instead, he rebels against his country, takes the Alicorn, and embarks on his own mission to bring death and destruction to Osea, forcing Strider Squadron to attempt to stop him. These were some of, if not the best missions in the game in my opinion, featuring a good variety of gameplay, challenging difficulty, and a fantastic finale. Facing off against the massive, submersible aircraft carrier really gave me ace combat vibes as the thing is essentially the Synfaxi's much bigger brother. I really, really enjoyed Ace Combat 7. I feel like it was a fantastic return to form for the series, and it makes me really excited for what the future holds. The gameplay offered is absolutely top-notch, best of the series in my opinion, and it's packaged beautifully. The visuals and audio are just fantastic. It's definitely a top 3 Ace Combat game for me now. But what are your thoughts? How do you think it stacks up to its predecessors? Let me know down below. This is Jarbo Gaming, we'll see you on the next one. What?